when you ask business people, the free market folks who can help um, and what role does government play, almost everybody in the business community says, boy, does government play a major role in this one to help us have the kind of workers that we're going to need in the future to grow and prosper and provide jobs. So I, I really endorse this notion. Thanks for all of you for coming. And uh, happy Valentine's Day or happy pre-Valentine's Day. You know, I used to run the Minnesota Business Partnership, and one of the things we did was we worked with Dun & Bradstreet and other others, and we went out and we asked owners and operators of business, kind of like you're being asked today, a series of questions, the same series of questions every year. Every year, the number one uh, most important, most critical need that business shared to us, and, and this wasn't just the big companies, this was, uh, this was companies of all sizes in Minnesota. A representative sample, there were several thousand involved in this survey. And they said, people are our number one product. People are our number one concern in our businesses. And, and then we'd ask them, well, how does it look for the people you have and for the people you're going to have in the future? And always, and we're talking the 80s and 90s, always business said, thumbs up. We really got great people now, and we really got great confidence that we're going to have great people tomorrow. We support our schools, blah, blah, blah. If we did that same survey today, that would not happen. It's very clear, just like our survey that's going on right now, it's very clear that business lacks confidence in that stream of people that will help them grow and prosper. Uh, interestingly, because businesses are quite bullish on the economy, over eight out of 10 right now in Minnesota are saying, hey, we think the future looks pretty good, but when we say, um, regarding your future workers and your next five to 10 year plans to grow, um, uh, you will see that around 40% are very, very concerned and around 60% register uh, negative concerns right now about having available quality, qualified workers, et, et cetera, to help their companies prosper. Now these companies are gonna grow, but they're not likely to grow in Minnesota if they can't find people around, around which to grow. So today we've asked three people that really are holding the pulse of what government does. So overall, uh, what you can see is that the state of Minnesota's economy is in good shape. Um, we're growing, we're adding jobs. Many of you in here probably have jobs currently posted and are looking for qualified applicants. In fact, when you were responding to that survey, you said that there is an issue in finding qualified applicants for your jobs. Uh, this is a long-term trend. Minnesota has um, been recovering for the last five years and uh, at a little bit faster pace than the United States as a whole. So Minnesota's economy really looks pretty strong. A lot of the economic indicators that we keep track of are showing positive signs. We're adding jobs uh, and a lot of those jobs are being added here in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, our hiring activity has surpassed pre-recession levels. We've got more job openings now than we had um, even before the recession started in 2007. Um, the number of uh, uh, job vacancies that we recorded in the second quarter of 2014 was the highest number we've seen since 2001. So really a significant amount of hiring activity happening right now. Uh, average work weeks are extending. Uh, it's up over 34 hours per week right now, which is the highest we've seen, um, again, since earlier in the decade. Uh, labor force participation rates are recovering. The, the state of Minnesota, we're known for a really hard work ethic. We have the fourth highest labor force participation rate in the United States. Um, and we're also seeing our educational attainment rates rising. Um, we have the fourth highest percentage of people with a high school diploma, the tenth highest percentage of people with bachelor's degrees or higher. So we have a, a really well-educated workforce that's available um, within the state of Minnesota. Uh, overall, uh, the state of Minnesota has been seeing job growth really across every sector. Um, 18 of the 19 sectors in the state gained jobs uh, in the last year. Uh, manufacturing actually led the way. They were gaining the most net new jobs during that time frame, but there was also significant growth in healthcare, construction, uh, government, professional and technical services, and really across the board, the only industry that saw a decline was transportation and warehousing. And some of that is actually being taken up by self-employment. Uh, 
Long term, too, the same types of trends. Um, we're seeing growth really across the entire economy, not just within one industry. Uh, healthcare has been the strongest growing industry over the last five years. And really, if you look back, um, healthcare is, is now the largest employing industry in the state and has seen the strongest growth over the last 15 years. Uh, but we're also seeing a really strong recovery in <coughs> manufacturing, uh, construction. Those are two areas that got hit pretty hard during the recession. They've recovered. Um, professional and technical services has been growing. Accommodation and food services, retail trade, also have been seeing a lot of growth due to increasing consumer confidence. Um, and then in other parts of the state, mining actually saw a pretty significant increase in employment in the last couple of years. So uh, in response to that survey question, you know, uh, one of the things that we're seeing is that the employment rate, the unemployment rate has gone down significantly in the state of Minnesota. Right now it's 3.6% which is about 2% lower than the United States overall. And really that makes for a pretty tight labor market. And uh, obviously uh, unemployment rates are relatively low in the Twin Cities, but it's spread across the state. It's not just the Twin Cities that are seeing this employment growth and the, the tightening of the labor market. In fact, the lowest unemployment rates are out where I'm from, out in Southwest Minnesota. Uh, the highest unemployment rates tend to be in North Central Minnesota, but even then uh, are relatively low in comparison to the rest of the nation. <clears throat> so what happens then is when you have a whole bunch of hiring activity and uh, far less people who are actively seeking work uh, and currently unemployed, uh, you start to get a really tight labor market. And that's evidenced if you compare the number of job seekers, active job seekers through the unemployment rate with the number of job vacancies that are being reported by businesses in the state of Minnesota. And so you can see through the second quarter of 2014, we had about 1.6 job seekers per vacancy. That's a really tight market because if you think about as you're trying to do your hiring to find uh, the person that has the right skill set that you're looking for, um, when you're competing with all of these other job vacancies, what are the odds that they have the right skill set for your position? And it's, it, it's a much different market than it was in the midst of the recession. If you look, uh, there was actually 7.7 .7 job seekers per vacancy at the height of the recession in the second quarter of 2009. That's a lot easier uh, environment for businesses to find qualified employees for the job vacancies that they have. Now, uh, as the economy has gotten better and more people are getting placed into the labor force, um, we've, we've noticed some, uh, some trends, though, it, uh, that are a little bit uh, concerning for us. Not every labor force group has been getting placed at the same rate, and there are still some disparities within the state of Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> one thing, uh, Minnesota has a, a pretty significant disparity in the unemployment rates um, for different minorities, and so um, the unemployment gap, in fact, is one of the largest in the United States. Uh, here, but there's also a challenge for some people who have been long-term unemployed, who've been uh, unemployed for longer than six months or a year, in getting re in placed back into the labor market. And then there's also been some challenges for people who have post-secondary education, which may sound a little strange um, when we talk about having a skills gap and having a hard time finding qualified employees. So Deed actually tried to study uh, what was happening behind this skills gap issue. And two interesting things came up. One is a skills gap is when you can't find people with the right training or education for the job that you have available. And that certainly is happening in certain instances. But we're also seeing a lot of evidence of hiring difficulties, issues where people aren't able to, uh, employers aren't able to find people, not because those people don't exist, but because there are demand side factors that aren't lining up for them, such as unattractive work hours, maybe uncompetitive wages, uh, maybe um, the schedule uh, or uh, geographic location. <clears throat> That's certainly an issue uh, out in greater Minnesota. Um, I was talking with Dave before the, the meeting started here, and he was saying, you know, some of the challenges that you can't find enough people within your region to uh, recruit for that. So uh, we did some additional research with employers to find out if you have those jobs open, why are they staying open? And it really is kind of a fascinating report. 
Uh, DEED also does an employment outlook, trying to look at what's going to happen in the future. And so uh, we do 10-year projections. And in the next decade, the state of Minnesota is expected to continue to see job growth. In fact, we're expecting to see about a 7% growth in jobs over the next decade, which would amount to about 205,000 net new jobs, jobs that don't currently exist and that are created due to new demand from businesses. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of things that we can't predict between now and then that might change those projections, changes in technology, and that's one of the ways that employers deal with labor force shortages, uh, legislative changes, wars, recessions, those types of things that we can't always uh, predict accurately. Um, but in general, our, our guess is that the state is going to continue growing, and we actually ratcheted back projections a little bit because of this issue of labor force growth. We, d we won't see as fast of labor force growth in the next decade as we have in past decades. And it becomes an issue because in addition to the 205,000 net new jobs that we're expected to create, there's also going to be about 675,000 jobs that need to be replaced due to uh, retirements. People who are moving out of the labor force because um, either they've uh, made enough money that they don't need to work anymore or maybe have reached retirement age and, and would like to enjoy that portion of their life. So the way that it looks, uh, if you're looking at specific occupations, is that in each case, uh, occupational groups are going to have way more replacement openings than they're going to have net new job growth. And of course, that's important because uh, as you're aiming people at careers, you don't necessarily need to always look at the fastest growing jobs. You also need to look at demand from replacement openings uh, due to people either retiring or changing careers completely. There are a couple spots where the net new job growth is going to be uh, close to or equivalent to the replacement openings. That's personal care um, and healthcare support, which tend to be lower wage and lower skill types of jobs. Uh, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, again, a lot of what we hear is that uh, we have skills gaps or that we need to have uh, focus entirely on post-secondary education. And that's certainly a worthwhile goal, and that's one of the reasons that Minnesota has had such a successful economy uh, over time and coming out of this recession. But a lot of the jobs that are available in the state of Minnesota require a high school diploma or less, and then uh, you get some sort of on-the-job training. And if you look overall, uh, almost two-thirds of the jobs in the state of Minnesota can be had with a high school diploma or less, at least in terms of entry-level requirements. Now, that being said, the fastest growing jobs uh, in the state of Minnesota are expected to be those that require some post-secondary training, um, whether uh, some college, a certificate, uh, associate degree, bachelor's degree, or higher. <clears throat> so the current situation, especially coming out of the most recent recession, it created kind of a tough job market for many recent college graduates. Now, as the state's economy has recovered and thing, hiring activity is picking up, these numbers will start to improve. But what we've seen is that a lot of the people who have graduated from post-secondary institutions in the state of Minnesota in the last couple of years have really struggled to attach themselves to the labor force in full-time, year-round jobs um, that are paying high enough wages to sustain a family. And so one of the challenges that we have is if employers are talking about a skills gap is making sure that our labor force supply is aligning as well as possible with labor market demand. <clears throat> and of course, part of the challenge is that because the state is expected to see uh, relatively modest growth at 7% growth rate over the next decade, there isn't expected to be a whole lot of net new job growth um, created in the state of Minnesota in comparison to the number of replacement openings that are needed. And a lot of the largest occupations, again, um, like if you're looking at the state of Minnesota as a whole, the largest occupations are in office and administrative support, uh, sales and related occupations, and then food preparation and serving related. Uh, and a lot of the jobs in those categories require a high school diploma or less, um, and then some sort of on-the-job training. Although you'll also see as uh, the scale slides down, there is faster growth expected in some of the job categories that require higher education. Uh, one of the things that happens then, especially during this recession, is uh, that, that over-education within the market tends to push the unemployment rate down uh, the educational attainment scale. So for people who have uh, post-secondary education, 
a lot of times employers will look at them more favorably when they're doing their hiring, and that may end up displacing people with lower educational attainment, which tends to raise the unemployment rate for those groups that have uh, lower educational attainment. And you can see the, the red bar there is showing the unemployment rate by educational attainment within the state of Minnesota. Uh, and as a consequence of that issue then, we have a lot of people who have uh, four-year degrees who are working in jobs that wouldn't typically require a four-year degree. Now certainly some of these people are working in those jobs by choice, um, whether it's something that they enjoy doing or it's uh, a good match for their skill set. Um, but there are many occupations where uh, people with a bachelor's degree are simply overeducated for the job requirements. A lot of people with bachelor's degrees are working as retail salespeople or secretaries or childcare workers or nursing aides or cashiers or things like that. Um, and so, again, one of the challenges then for uh, our post secondary education system and our labor market is to do uh, a better job of aligning skill sets that are in demand with. Um, job vacancies within the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is an example of different fields of study uh, that are produced from Minnesota's post-secondary institutions. And so you can see on here, we've got engineering, construction trades, computer and information sciences, uh, health professions, engineering technologies, business management and marketing. All of those are, are degree areas that tend to have higher placement rates and tend to result in higher wages for those workers. Uh, the the educational programs that are listed on the bottom, visual and performing arts, transportation, communications, area, ethnic, cultural, gender, and group studies, history, and theology, tend to have much lower uh, labor force attachment rates. Um, and they have a harder time finding full-time, permanent, year-round uh, employment, and the wage rates tend to be lower. Uh, so what that means is there's a, a misalignment between those specific skill sets and what the labor market is currently looking for. Uh, so this table shows employment outcomes for graduates from specific uh, fields of study, and this could be used with any of those different degree programs that we talked about on the last slide. So for example, uh, people who are graduating from computer and information science programs in the state of Minnesota, a lot of them are getting placed in permanent full-time year-round employment uh, in industries that you would expect to see using computer and information science workers. So professional and technical services, information, manufacturing, and the wage rates tend to be commensurate with what you would see for a four-year uh, degree in computer science. Uh, in contrast, then, uh, not to pick on visual and performing arts, but that's uh, uh, an educational program that doesn't fare as well in the labor market. There isn't as much demand for uh, people with those specific skill sets. And so the largest industry of employment for visual and performing arts graduates are retail trade and accommodation and food services. And again, those people are likely overeducated for the jobs that they're taking. So what does this information tell us? Well, if wage and employment rates are the outcome of the interaction between supply and demand, they tell us a lot about what's in demand in the labor force right now. Um, obviously, computer and information science graduates are doing quite well. It's easy for them to get placed. They tend to earn back significant amounts of money. And in contrast, there are other degree programs that maybe aren't as in demand within the state of Minnesota um, right now. Uh, providing this data to young people to um, especially as they're selecting a major, maybe selecting a school. Uh, also providing it to incumbent workers who are looking for additional training, um, providing it to job counselors, high school counselors, uh, helps people make uh, important decisions for their future. We don't wanna discourage people from investing in education, it's, it's a wise investment, uh, but we wanna help them make sure that they're aligning with what the labor market is looking for to help you guys solve that issue of workforce shortages. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Chancellor Rosenstone. Terrific. And thank you very much for the opportunity. We either solve this problem or we will not be competitive. It's not about competing with Kansas and Iowa and Wisconsin, the Dakotas. It's about competing with Switzerland and Germany and Japan and Korea. It's a different game than it was in the last century and the human capital dimension is the most critical variable in determining the prosperity of our state and prosperity of communities across uh, Minnesota. Uh, I'm joined this morning with two of our uh, college presidents, uh, with Cecilia Cervantes, who's president of Hennepin Technical College, and with Lisa Larson, who's the interim president 
at North Hennepin Community College. And our colleges and universities play an absolutely critical role in deciding what the workforce of Minnesota is going to look like and deciding whether we're going to be able to solve this puzzle that we're all confronting. Each year we serve over 400,000 students across the state in 47 communities. Nearly six out of 10 of all the undergraduates in the state of Minnesota are in one of our colleges or universities. 88% of our students are Minnesotans. And when they graduate, the overwhelming proportion of those students get jobs in their chosen field and stay in Minnesota. We're the state's largest provider by far of customized training, which are partnerships between our colleges and individual firms to ensure that employees remain at the cutting edge of their professions, serving about 120,000 students a year in customized training. The graduates we produce, about 40,000 graduates a year, become Minnesota's workforce. Our graduates are 9 out of 10 of the state's mechanics, 9 out of 10 of the people working in manufacturing, 8 out of 10 in law enforcement, 7 out of 10 in the trades, 7 out of 10 in agriculture, 3 out of 4 nurses, one half of all the teachers, one half of all the business graduates, and half of those in information technology. These people are the, are the people that uh, build our homes, build our roads, run our cities, build our bridges, manage our businesses, teach our children, take care of the sick. They're the number one person to show up when tragedy strikes. They keep our plants hunting, humming, and they farm the land that feeds us all. And we provide an extraordinary education and a very accessible education, both geographically and financially. But there's a whole lot more we need to do to tackle the puzzle that Cameron so eloquently put on the table for us. Yes, businesses across Minnesota are facing critical workforce shortages. Uh, there's a need for us to deliver graduates that have not just technical skills, but the foundational skills of critical thinking, the ability to work together in teams, the ability to apply theory and information to new problems and solve those problems in creative ways and communicate effectively across geographic and cultural boundaries. <coughs> the baby boomers are going to retire. And if you take Cameron's data and play it out just five more years, 15 years from now, we're going to have to replace nearly 1.3 million baby boomers. Plus, there's going to be, we hope, growth in our economy, which creates the demand for new employees as well. How are we going to solve that puzzle together? recognizing that the graduates of tomorrow have to have even more skills and more capabilities than the workers that they're replacing. The data coming out of the Georgetown work is that 74% of all the jobs in Minnesota in 2020 will require some post-secondary education. But as Cameron appropriately pointed out, barely half of those jobs will require a baccalaureate degree. They'll require certificates or diplomas or associate degrees for the work that needs to be done in Minnesota and there is no other state in the nation that requires a more highly educated workforce than Minnesota. And if we screw that one up, we will not compete, as I suggested at the outset. The 3.6% unemployment is great news for Minnesota. It makes this puzzle even tougher for us to solve uh, together. And as Cameron suggested, and as the state demographer has pointed out, we will, between now and 2025, see a continual dip in the population growth of our state down to a record low 0.1% in 2025, meaning that our ability to produce the human beings we need to fill the jobs that need to, uh, need to be filled is slowing down as a result of the slower population growth. And we also need to keep in mind that over the next 25 years, two-thirds of all the population growth in the state of Minnesota and 100% of all the population growth here in the metro area will be among people of color, people who traditionally have not been well served by education and higher education. And if we do not find a way to close the gaps that exist across education in Minnesota, we will have a humongous shortage of talent in order to fill the jobs of the future. Simply put, we cannot afford, given the slowing growth of our population and the demographic changes in our state, we simply cannot afford to leave anyone behind. And at the same time, we also need to own up that for many Minnesotans, higher education is simply too costly. So these are the puzzles we need to solve, and I think it's time to stop admiring the problem 
and get to work. And the essential question is, how are we going to solve these challenges? You know, I could tell you what higher education is going to do or ought to do, and Senator Bonoff can tell you what the legislature is going to do, and Deed can tell you what it might do, and each business sector can tell you what it's going to do. But I got news for you. If we all bring separate solutions to the table, it ain't going to get done. And it's only going to get done if we find ways in which we put the pieces together to come up with a shared solution to the puzzle. Because it requires us getting the information we need. It requires us responding and creating the programs to deliver the graduates you need. It requires us working differently with K-12 because we can have perfect programs turning out exactly the skill sets you need and instantaneously make the changes you need. But if we can't fill the seats in those programs because students don't want to come to welding or advanced manufacturing or precision manufacturing, or uh, mechatronics or whatever, we will not get the job done. We've got to think of the totality of this system, uh, as, as Cameron has uh, suggested, and it does require us working together in some fundamentally new ways. So this is how we've been trying to do that, and it's all been done in partnership with you. We began, when I arrived, we began by listening. We worked in partnership with DEED and with chambers across the state of Minnesota to conduct 55 listening sessions, sector by sector, in every community around the state to get a better understanding of how well we were doing in turning out the graduates you needed to make your firm successful and to meet the workforce needs. We went back, we started retooling our programs, we turned some programs off, we turned some new programs on, and following on uh, uh, Representative Carlson's point, we still do have those local advisory committees that are program by program meeting with their industry partners to make sure in real time that we're getting an alignment with what their needs are. And each college has a foundation board, which is largely uh, these days, as in uh, the case of Hennepin Tech, a foundation board led by industry partners to help think about the totality of, uh, of, of, of the college. That's good work, but it simply isn't enough. It isn't enough because the problem is a little more complicated. So the data Cameron shared with us is terrific data. But the data, depending on the source we get, is between six months and a year old. And it's no fault of deed. They're working with the data as fast as they get it. So let's think about this. We get data that we all use that's even six months old. We sit down and our faculty in 24 hours make the adjustments in the program to get it right. And our faculty always work that fast and we always get it done that quickly. <laughs> But let's assume for the sake of argument, we do get it done that quickly. We get the data from Deed the day after they get it. We get the program adjusted the day after we get the data. And the first graduates coming out 24 months later. Or in the case of a baccalaureate degree, four years later. We're skating to where the puck was. And that simply isn't good enough. That doesn't give us a competitive edge. And that will leave a structural gap for eternity because the industries are moving faster than two and four year legs. And we need at a minimum real time data about what the specific skills needed industry by industry are, not data that are even six months old. And we need that data in the hands of employers, employer advisory groups, colleges, universities, and I would argue in the hands of high school students so they can begin to see exactly what Cameron was suggesting what are the skills needed? What are the hot careers needed? And how do we make sure that if we have a great program, we're actually able to fill the seats to produce the number of graduates we need with skills closer to the real-time skills? But let's think a little harder. What happens if we were able to engage in data analytics and conversations that would allow us to work together to think out ahead six months, a year, or 24 months? And that's hard work. And that's not something any of us have done a very good job on, quite frankly. But if we can do it in a way where we're skating to where the puck's really going to be, always making adjustments along the way because the forecasts are going to be somewhat fuzzy, then we're going to be in a position to really get ahead of this, have total alignment between what the academy's doing, what the pipeline's producing in terms of students to fill those classes, and what your needs are. That's precisely the work that we've been doing the last two years in partnership with DEED, in partnership with the Chamber, Bill Blazer has been involved in this, in partnership with workforce centers around the state, 90 businesses across the state, foundations the United Way, and that is to identify the information systems 
that will move us from lag data to real-time data and eventually to thinking out six months to two years uh, in advance. We ran pilots this summer, tremendous, tremendous results embraced by business as well as higher education, workforce centers and the like. Those results have been turned over to DEED. They'll be brought to scale statewide this year. And we're working on putting together an advisory board led by business to make sure that we're going to continually have the accountabilities to make sure that those data are available and will be available to K-12 uh, as well. We've got to skate to where the puck's going to be and we need to do it together. Third point, we have worked with great assistance from legislation uh, uh, from a legislature in 2013, assistance of Commissioner Pogamiller, assistance of Commissioner Brenda Casillas in the Department of Education, the governor, to think differently about how we align high school and post-secondary education. And we've made some humongous changes to make sure that we got standards and, and information about preparedness that isn't here, where, high where college readiness is over here. We need these two aligned and we need information earlier in the high schools to let students know that they're not on track, and we need to intervene earlier with remedial work being done at the high school level, not at the college level, and if students are not on track, they need to know that, and we need to help get them on track before they graduate. And we also need to take all this information we've been trying to gather about the future workforce needs and get it in the hands of students, get it in the hands of academic advisors and parents so they can begin to think differently about what it means to get a post-secondary education. When we have jobs that are going unfilled with starting salaries of $60,000 a year that require two years of education, and that's a starting salary for career, and we can't get students to understand that this is a hot career, it's not your hands being dirty, but it's Star Wars technology, we got a problem that we got to solve in partnership with you by going together into the schools telling the story about what this industry looks like. You help us recruit students to our program, you provide the internships, and together we solve the problem. But we can't solve it without bringing it back to K-12, and we can't solve it without, uh, without you, and, and we're doing that. And I also, as others have already done, want to call out the leadership of, of Senator Bonoff. Uh, it's been absolutely terrific. She's been thinking uh, from the get-go of her chairship uh, uh, of the Higher Ed and Workforce Committee about how it is we put these pieces together. And I would say, quite frankly, uh, she's been absolutely fearless, uh, absolutely fearless in trying to get us all to think in uh, new ways and to really put the needs of students and the workforce uh, up front in the agenda that she's helped set uh, for, the center, for the Senate. And the, the final couple points I want to make here is that uh, we've been partnering in new ways with employers across the state. So over the past two years, uh, our, our presidents and their faculty have received a total of $37.5 million in tech grants to allow us to redesign in partnership with industry uh, the education we're providing, particularly at our technical colleges. So the last one we just got was a $15 million partnership with colleges across the state on advanced uh, manufacturing and this dramatically, dramatically changes the way in which we can build the skills and pipeline of, of, of graduates that are, are needed. Last point here is that inside of Minskew, we also need to be working in some fundamentally different ways. And you've probably heard a word or two uh, about charting the future. I've managed to get uh, many other things off the front page of the newspapers. Uh, but fundamentally, what this is about is recognizing that we in higher education need to make some changes to better serve students. Uh, it's about getting our colleges and universities across the state to work together in some new ways to better maximize the investments that the good people of Minnesota have made in those colleges and universities and to maximize the talents of our faculty and staff. It's about working in new ways to make education more affordable. It's about working in new ways to graduate more students and to graduate them faster in a more cost-effective way. It's about working together in new ways to make sure that those students are actually prepared for the jobs of the future and that we can demonstrate that they are prepared for the jobs of the future. Graduation rates have to increase. We have our own achievement gap in Minskew between students of color who start and non-students of color who start, and we have to close that achievement gap, particularly given the demographics I shared with you a few moments ago. We need to be in a position where if you come to one of our colleges and you already know the material, you shouldn't have to sit through the class a second time. 
in order to get credit because the degree program says so. Why not just be able to take the test, demonstrate you know it, and get credit for your prior learning? That enhances affordability, it speeds time to completion, and it will speed student success. And when students move from one institution to another, it has to be seamless. They can't lose credits, it can't slow down progress, it can't raise costs. And when we graduate a student, it's not just a matter of saying that she has sat quietly for 120 credits and achieved a B average. We need to be a whole lot more specific about the capabilities of those graduates and how those capabilities align with the needs that, uh, that you're trying to fill. Uh, as you've probably read, this has made a few folks no nervous. I get that changes sometimes stuff that makes folks uh, a little nervous. But I work for the students, I work for you, I work for communities across Minnesota, and the commitment is to do what we need to to improve the quality of the education, the quality of our graduates. And I also um, want to thank Senator Bonoff uh, for her support for the work we need to do. She knows we need to do things differently. She's an advocate for pushing us to do things differently, and her support of the changes we're trying to make has been absolutely uh, critical. And I'm not bashful, as Senator Bonoff is not bashful, about speaking up for the stuff that we just got to do better. Um, and that, of course, has made a few folks nervous. So as I began by saying, um, if our human capital was the secret to our success in the last century, it's even more critical in this century. And the challenges we're facing from competition, from slowing population growth, from the skills that are needed more than ever before, from the diversity of our population, which means that we're dealing with, with communities that are not as well prepared and that we have not served as well as we should be serving. Those are all challenges that can either be the perfect storm, that in the long run hurt communities, businesses, and our state, or it can be the perfect storm that energizes us to engage with each other, to work together in partnership uh, to meet these challenges. I'm quite convinced we're on the, on the second path. This is an imperative. We have no alternative. If it ain't human capital that's the secret sauce to Minnesota's economic future, whatever number two is, it's a long way behind. This is the one we need to solve, and I'm committed to working with you to do it. Thank you. I am excited to be here to talk about these issues. As you heard from Deed, and, and in fact, we had a higher ed workforce development summit on December 8th at the Minnesota History Center where we also had Deed as one of our presenters to go through that data. Uh, Sean Kershaw, who's here, really was a key person in pulling all that together. And as we looked at some of those statistics saying, oh, you know, many of these jobs really don't need a post-secondary degree. I would have to push back on that and say, how many of you want to have an administrative assistant who only has a high school diploma? Because I would say that's just not in fact the case. You know, my legislative assistant most likely would be listed on that chart as an administrative assistant who might only need high school diploma. Well, that is not true. He is a top scholar from the University of Minnesota, and I hired him because of his strong analytic and writing skills. And I think if we look at many of the jobs that might be listed there, well, you start in, in an entry level way, but we hope that you have the potential to actually be management and to be leadership at wherever you start. And so I'm somebody who says, no, each and every Minnesotan ought to have a post-secondary degree, and that's what we should stand for, because if we want Minnesota to lead this nation, we don't want to under-train our future workforce. And so I, I'm always going to push back when I hear those statistics. As we look at how to solve, and I have talked about this before with Twin West, but I haven't had the time to really take you through how we approached it, what the package we've put together, and what's gonna be required to make this work. And so it's perfect that I'm sitting right across from Luann from the Advanced Manufacturing, who's been my partner all throughout this. Last session, we passed legislation that we called the Pipeline Project, and you heard about that, but I've now been asked to drop the pipeline name because there's been a little controversy over some <laughs> pipelines in the in the paper and so I've moved to now talking about it as the earn while you learn approach well, keystone. <laughs> <laughs> the keystone project because it's key to our future um, so last session what we did is we picked just like deed identified 
the various industries that were the emerging strong industries, we put them in legislation and we said health sciences, just like you identified, advanced manufacturing, IT, and then agriculture, because we know agriculture is so important to the future of Minnesota and really to the world. We uh, are responsible for feeding the planet. When you look at, we've got Cargill here, we've got General Mills, we have so many of those companies that play such an important role. So we picked those four industries and then we did build advisory councils. We brought the industry leaders together. So we had folks from Cargill, from Land Lakes, from Hormel, from the pork producers. In IT, we had Target, we had Best Buy, we had Deloitte, we had Thomson Reuters. They all came together, joined by the folks from MinSTU, the folks from University of Minnesota, and we said, okay, let's take this dual education approach and figure out, can we do this in Minnesota? So stepping back, in other places, particularly Europe, where this is um, something that is just common everyday course, in Germany, for example, 65% of students, when they leave high school, do so in partnership with a company. They're actually hired by that company. Call it an apprenticeship if you want, but it's commonly referred to as dual education because dual meaning number one, you're getting on the job training because you work for the company, but at the same time, you're in a higher ed institution getting classroom related instruction. And it could be a one year program, a two year program, or a four year program. And so we said on these advisory councils, what jobs could we test? The benefits of this kind of approach, when you look at what are the challenges we face, you've got the overwhelming student debt on the one hand, you've got students who once they incur that debt, they finish and say, but can I get a job in what I even studied? And you've got businesses who, you know, we've got all these students coming out with this high debt who are saying the kids aren't even trained. So this approach actually solves for all of it. It says they're not gonna have that kind of debt because they're gonna be working while they're in school. Number two, they're gonna learn those on the job training skills so when they're done, the companies aren't gonna say they're not trained. And then we hear often most times that the soft skills are what our millennial generation is really missing. They don't know how to do a memo. They don't know how to look every person in the eye and shake hands and, and say, you know, welcome to the office or whatever the soft skills are that I hear about. They don't come on time. They, they don't have the work ethic. I actually reject all that. I think they do. I think they just haven't had the proper proper training and mentorship to be able to execute it properly. So if you give them the time to be on the job training, they're gonna learn those soft skills and they're not gonna get discouraged. Oftentimes kids drop out or, or they get discouraged when they don't feel like their higher education is relevant to their future. And so when they're on the job, while they're in school, they understand the relevance of what they're doing. So that's really the idea, but then you say, okay, well, how are you really gonna do this? How are you gonna have this happen when in our culture, that's not how we do it. In our culture, we've begun to understand the importance of internships, but unfortunately, the you know early uh, way of doing internships has been free internships. So the kids, it really actually, causes an even worse achievement gap because then the kids whose parents can help them while they're doing a free internship have a better uh, chance of getting a great job after and those who are working two jobs just to stay in school, there's no way they get to do that free internship and so again, the playing field is not level. So in this scenario, that is taken away. So number one, you don't have the debt issues, you have the training, they're skilled in the way you want, but then the question is how are we actually going to execute and implement that approach? And so there was a reason why we did it first last year where we just had advisory councils so that we could get as many people around the table as possible. We had 50 companies working on this. That's a lot of just kind of foundational work, conversations, spreading the word. And so the legislation this session is very simple. It says that we're gonna create a pool of grant money for businesses and the business will apply for the money and to be eligible, a business must have hired 
a graduating student, must have hired a student ready to go to college. So they've made that commitment to the student, and then the business must have a relationship with a post-secondary institution to deliver the related classroom instruction. It can't just be in any job because this isn't customized training where the, you know, any business can say, I want to do this or I want to do that because I don't think that's a good use of taxpayer dollars. We want to make sure that our students are getting transferable credentials that if they leave one company, they're able to go on to the next. And so we say that they're also only eligible to use this seed money if the job is one where the Department of Labor has got competency standards for that occupation. So we're gonna start with these four industries and within each of the industries, we identified in the early work which jobs we were gonna start with. So for example, in IT, you've got computer coder, computer co programmer, and manufacturing. You've got uh, mechatronic um, skills. And we picked what these were and uh, Commissioner Lumen at the Department of Labor and Industry, and uh, we actually stole one of your deans from St. Paul College <laughs> uh, to help be the project manager on this. They've been working very hard with subject matter experts to list the competency standards. So again, like Chancellor Rosenstone said, rather than just have it be about degrees, the thing that makes this work in Europe is that there's, the industry says this is what somebody needs to learn and know in order to be qualified. So we're gonna put those standards out there and any institution can deliver the training as long as those standards are embedded in the curriculum. So it sounds complicated and that's why I'm glad to have the time to really take you through it, but I look, for example, at Chase Anderson, who's the superintendent of Wyzetta Schools, and one of the missing links, to be honest, Superintendent Anderson, is how are these businesses gonna meet the students? So I really you know, think that's gonna be up to the K-12 and the business community to solve together, but a couple different ideas. One is there could be you know, community college fairs where the businesses can also come. You know, I first started this approach, and I think I've shared that with uh, the company in Plymouth, Bueller Corporation, that has been doing this now for three years. And I know they just went and interviewed high school students in the surrounding schools, and so they found a way in. So I'm sure they're actually, um, it isn't that complicated. The other option is to use our workforce centers. And so on a parallel path, we are moving legislation to allow our workforce center counselors on a statewide basis to have a role in our high schools. We did a test two years ago where we said three workforce centers, take your workforce center counselors and go into the high schools and see if you can be effective in introducing the students to their careers. That was so successful that now there are a couple bills moving forward where we take that statewide. So I think so, those are some of the potential solutions. Um, but you in the audience, I would request that I can tell I'm getting the, he wants me to stop, all right. <laughs> the last thing is, um, when this bill passes, please businesses, try it. Try applying for these grants, hire these kids, and be the ones that spread the word. Because we in the Twin West community are the leaders and we're willing to, to get started. So thank you very much. Uh, let's let's give our panel a hand again. Thank you, guys. You did a terrific job. Uh, I don't know about you, but it is refreshing to have some real uh, solutions, ideas, etc. And I think business is going to have to always, always be uh, at the forefront of all of this. So, so the challenge for us to step up and be part of that is really important. Uh, we want to just real quickly uh, remind you about our leadership luncheon coming up next week on Wednesday. I think we have like two or three seats left. Uh, so I'm looking at Allie back there. We, we only have just a couple left, so get registered for that and join us. We're back here on March the 13th, and uh, we look forward to having you all join us then. Thank you for your time today.